If I'm already laughing, it's because I have in studio with me Andy Karstner, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Earth Day. Appreciate you being here. So happy to be with you, especially today. Right? So I'm looking at my notes so I don't miss anything. Andy, and this list is not exhaustive, is a leading corporate innovation strategist, a clean energy entrepreneur, policymaker, regulator, diplomat, space cowboy, that's a thing, and <laughs> my favorite title is friend, because despite your incredible resume, I would say reputationally, you're best known for being a connector and really an amplifier of good ideas and good people. So even though you are executive leadership currently at X, and that was formerly Google X, and you were George W. Bush's assistant secretary of energy, and you're currently on the board of Exxon Mobil as an internal climate activist, you are genuinely best known for loving what you do and really connecting with people and the work. And it really shows. So you just won, <laughs> you just won the role of writing my epitaph. So you count on being me having my will revised. So, I am uh, happy to, you more that. than happy to. It's very generous. That's it's very, a, it's very easy. Yeah. For you, a, it's very easy. It's a, I think that's the intro my, my uh, father would be proud of and my mother would believe. Uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we want to get into some juicy details of what you've been up to. Sure. And the audience can Google juicy details. Um, but we'll start with the juiciest here and then feel free to follow up on your own. You are on the board of one of the biggest polluters of all time, ExxonMobil. Please explain to us how this happened. And is there hope for turning this oil and gas giant around? Well, so how it happened is uh, by a vote of the shareholders at uh, last year's annual general meeting. It's almost uh, going to be a year now. Um, it was fairly historic and fairly surprising, not least to me. Right. Um, uh, you know, we had to do a lot right to make it happen. And, and that entailed simply having a useful strategy for shareholders to put their arms around on capital allocation, how a company spends its money what its future would be in terms of midterm and long-term planning, a energy transition that they could viably believe in, and what kind of uh, action they were taking to deal with climate change risk, uh, amongst other things. Um, so so it's, uh, it, can things turn around? Yes, I think that the company is, uh, all companies have to be deeply sensitive to who their owners are, right. um, and their owners get to vote. So I believe democratic stakeholder capitalism works. Um, uh, a lot of people would say, well, I'd rather abdicate, I'd rather divest, I don't want to give my money to these things. You don't get your money into it, you don't get a vote, you don't get to influence it. So the idea that we can influence things, and as your last speaker said, um, make the uh, ESG movement more mature, more impactful, more influential to outcomes, uh, I think those are good things and good trends. No, definitely. Do you get pushback? Do people understand what it is that you're trying to do here internally? Because there is so much, um, there is so much effort from those that are really trying to make an impact on the climate movement that are saying, okay, what we need to do is, is have the CEO step down, for example. But it's not as simple as that. As somebody who's now inside the beast, tell us what it will actually take. And you just did. But how do you actually respond to those who are like, why are you getting involved in the process as opposed to just, you know, from the outside coming up and just saying, absolutely not, just this right, is what it is. Right. And I think you phrase it right, that it's not as simple as that. It's people like to have a binary choice between what's good and bad and, and so forth. It is not as simple as that. In fact, what's happening with our oil and gas companies is for a long time, they've been morphing into energy companies and we want them to morph even further into carbon molecules management companies. We want them to profit from keeping nature uh, more secure at a faster rate than to profit from extraction and exploitation. It's really sort of that simple. And and if they have become that efficient at seismology and subsurface engineering and geology, you know, all these legal entities are really aggregations of intellectual capital. And I can't tell you the amount of young people in, in management, middle management it, that, are, that are enthusiastic, including the CEO, about being pushed to a faster pace in a new direction. So in just a year's time, we have released uh, um, um, the uh, uh, net zero strategy that didn't exist before, um, um, a $15 billion budget for low carbon solutions that exceeds the amounts being allocated by the United States government for the same uh, problem of sequestration uh, and, um, and uh, a full disclosure and lobbying. And, and so great strides have been made. There's a great way to go. 
but it depends on people's engagement and having the faith that your fellow citizens are people of goodwill. They have children too. They, they believe in their or their parks and their in their in their water and their air to be clean. So it's not as easy as vilifying people. Sure. And let's face it, most people are still filling up their cars with ga- uh, with uh, oil. Right. And so it's not going anywhere. How do we reconcile those that are putting wa- asking or wanting a ban on oil and gas to those everyday decisions that require putting putting oil in their cars. So how do you how do you think about or how do you help those who are struggling with that um, with with that uh, with <laughs> paradox really? Yeah. How do you talk to them? About well, you know, it? you know, I'm one of your great fans. And, and one of the reasons I'm one of your great fans is that your title, your mission is about time. And time is the most difficult factor that people fail to integrate into the decision makings of a strategy. You know, and it's easy to say, well, we shouldn't have it. And that's true. We shouldn't have it tomorrow. We shouldn't have it in five years. We shouldn't have it in 10. What is the logical order of operations to do this so that we have a just society? This can be very punitive and regressive to people in society. And it's already happening now with 40 percent inflation that's affecting our food. Uh, You know, we've had the U.N. uh, um, World Bank meetings this week. Suffering is going on now because of the spike and shock going on in fuel because of this crazy and just war going on, right? So so we have disequilibrium in energy markets. And you can't, it's not as easy to say, turn the tap off. We've also got to open the aperture on the drain for carbon. We've got to be very deliberate about the carbon we take out of the atmosphere as much as those that we're avoiding sending into the atmosphere. So that's why when, when people say, well, it's just greenwashing to have a 2050 goal. No, no, it's not. If you're methodical in your plans and tactics and practical progression to reduce hydrocarbons, to reduce the impact of emissions, and to substitute them credibly with new sources. I've seen a trend. You know, we didn't have a single electric car on the road. We didn't have a single commercial LED uh, a light on the shelf when I left office in 2008. You know, we, what we did have was good, cohesive, bipartisan legislation that, you know, President Obama and President Bush agreed on that lasted for 10 years. Didn't account for artificial intelligence. Didn't account for the cloud. We barely even had iPhones at that time. So it's time again that we need a 10-year forecast and a plan that moves us forward together. But it really is about time. And there's not time time to slow down beginning our action. That's what you're saying. There's an urgency, but there is time to manage ourselves methodically and intelligently to get off the stuff that we don't need to have. Absolutely. And if anybody can see this overhaul come into reality, it's you with all of the different hats you wear and the roles that you play. And we need this type of passion. We need this type of drive. And individuals sometimes feel that they can't contribute. It seems too much out of their wheelhouse to say, I'm going to be part of this solution because the solutions are as big sounding as as uh, what we've been talking about all day today and now with you is we need to see major overhauls. We need to see the move to clean energy. We need to see bipartisan support behind all of that. What does the average person do to get involved and to feel that they can really be part of the solution? So we just finished up a panel called Investing with Intent because money matters and where people think about their financial um, decisions and where to allocate their their resources, however much that might be, that matters. That can make a difference. How do you think about the, um, where individuals can be part of the solution and where they can really put their money in a way that is going to be most impactful and effective? It's such a great question. <clears throat> and and it, I go one layer deeper because I have four daughters. And, 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 and I worry about a generation that asks themselves that question and ends up with a cynical or skeptical answer. Okay, so it starts with the confidence that we can do something. And betting against the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit of people from the bottom up is a bad bet. Nobody has ever won that bet in this country. So betting on innovation is the right thing to do. Not innovation writ large, I trust all tech and blah, 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 but saying there are can-do solutions and there are everywhere at every level, they're percolating in every city. So become involved in them, whether it's with social entrepreneurs, whether it's with private entrepreneurs, you know, believe in our capacity to problem solve. I would start there. Then very practically, you can invest in those companies. I was just talking with a gentleman from Sunrun who did very well, right? The the uh, obviously ever with Tesla, you've done very well. You can you can you can believe in those companies. But even our big oil giants, if they're behaving in a way that are de- showing deliberative transitional plans where we can profit from r- ridding ourselves of carbon, that can do well in terms of how you use your money. 
None of it will matter if policymakers in this town don't show up and act responsibly because the most immediate, most effective, most important, impactful things are things they've taken off the table because of dysfunction. So we, the number one thing they can do is recharge our democracy and get people to think sensibly about how to clean our air, clean our atmosphere, clean our water. If you say it loud enough, they might hear you. You're not far. <laughs> We're not, not far, far from the hill. We are, we are a stone's throw from the hill. Yeah. We are walking distance to the White House. This is what I love most about Washington, D.C. We were talking about this yesterday. Everything is walking. So. Yeah. Well, I'm saying I was on point for President Bush the last time we had an oil crisis in this country, $147 oil. We are going to that place yeah. again. So there is an opportunity for consensus when security, global security and geopolitical disruption meets longer term needs in climate. That's what we had in 2007. And I'm very hopeful that the urgency of all these things, our economic competitiveness, our security, the security of democracy in the world, the security of a world order that's given us a degree of stability to left, lift people's lives and assets can blend with the climate message so that we have urgency and we have acceleration and we have justice. Does that sound like you're coming back to Washington to be part of maybe a future administration to see? <laughs> you know, I sir, always serve at the pleasure of a president. I have no ambitions, <laughs> aspirations, and plans in that way. But uh, there is nobody who I won't help in public office of any party or stripe who has goodwill to try and problem solve. So today is a really special day, right? We're here because it's Earth Day, obviously. And we are in this really unique time where we are watching a war break out in Europe. Um, and it is a unique time in that it is all of the images and what is happening is being shared. It's really reverberating throughout the world. And the questions are being asked as to what extent individuals are also guilty for partaking in contributing to Putin's war machine because he's fueled by the profits that have been coming from oil and gas exportations from Russia. How do you think and talk about this? Well, uh, not speaking for ExxonMobil, but like the other oil, Western oil companies, they have done the right thing with immediacy and divested, right? That's, that's right for us. That doesn't mean that Vladimir Putin becomes poorer. He is actually one of the largest personal beneficiaries of the oil and gas industry. And so the higher that price, the more desperate that situation, the richer that particular despot becomes. And, and so we have this tragic situation with a land war in, in, in Europe for the first time in 77 years that was thought to be unthinkable, Holocaust-like conditions of destroying people in their own homes and schools and railways, etc. cetera. Um, so we do have a moral crisis of conscience. And I think many Europeans would say, yes, we are excessively dependent and more dependent than we thought. That has to fuel the urgency. That's what I'm talking about, the great convergence. The urgency you've been helping people think about in terms of scientifically, you know, our habitat loss and, and, the, and the threats we have for climate change are now deeply convergent with our own personal immediate security in the world order that was formed, you know, a, at the end of World War II. The world order that protected the idea of proliferating democracy and justice. And, and those things are at risk. So I think you have to blend them together. I don't really have time for blaming and saying, well, Germans, you shouldn't have been on that pipeline five and 10 years ago. There's enough pain in the system now. And my bet is if this war persists, it's going to get more painful. So how do we use that stimulus to accelerate faster? And so these are all solutions. And we think about transforming different industries, how we're going to work with oil and gas and really see some of these innovations come to market and be realized. On the other flip side, there are, there are solutions that are already tried and tested, like planting indigenous trees yes. um, around the world. Yes. And our theme today is nature-based solutions. Love it. And so if we can actually distribute and implement existing solutions in accordance with all of the different tools in the toolkit, right? Yes. From new, uh, from research and development all the way to discovering of new technologies, and then really just better distributing what's already out there. We can probably realize uh, and, and meet the urgency where it needs to be met. So how do you think about nature-based solutions as being part of this toolkit? Well, you, you and I had no prep for this at all, but, but I, that is actually why I'm in Washington this week. You know, uh, uh, meeting with Andrew Steer from uh, the Bezos Foundation. I just met with Naoko Ishii, the former head of the Global Environmental Facility. Um, I work on a portfolio of technologies that I call Measure the Treasure. We need to have a uniform, universal system of precision accounting that undergirds the ESG movement that makes these 
carbon markets, but also biodiversity markets real, not just a series of sequential disaggregated transactions, but a real way to bring nature onto the balance sheet. This, in theory, should be the easiest and first priority of everything we do. As much as we want to engineer geological solutions, man-made solutions to sequester carbon or to utilize carbon, we have the best engineered design ever. Trees, they exist. How do you keep them? How do you reforest them? How do you, how do you take care of nature to create the carbon sinks that are intended to be our most useful ally in this most desperate time? So that's actually a passion and priority and really a heavy priority for my technological inv investments. So you really are a proponent of all the solutions. If it's going to be a positive of impact on solving this climate crisis, you want to see, to see it through to fruition. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I would add to all these nice things you put under my epitaph. He was about urgency. <laughs> right. So I am not about uh, being mutually exclusive or a zero-sum game. Right. First past the post, and I am desperately uh, prioritizing conservation because simply uh, doing no harm to nature and facilitating nature's capacity is our first greatest tool. Yes. And if we can't do that, the idea that we can bank on future over the horizon solutions becomes a little bit more nebulous. So absolutely all of the above as fast as possible. Incredible. Okay. I mean, that is exactly the message that we wanted to get out to our audience today, that you are all part of the solution, all of the above and as fast as possible. Let's make it happen. Thank you so much, Andy. I appreciate you, you being here. Thanks for everything you do. You're the best. <laughs>